speak on this I guess since last uh, Thursday night when we had a just a wonderful time in the men's Vesper the 
that doesn't work out over there, we may just have to knock it off. I think I've got voice enough. Uh, but I want to talk to you this morning for just the next few moments. Uh, if the Lord doesn't speak to us, we may get out early because uh, the longer I preach, the more I've learned that the seat can all the mind can only end how does it go the mind can only take what the seat can endure the bottom line is uh, they can't handle it <clears throat> don't want to get any people sore here this morning anyway isn't it great living for God an exciting thing about it all is that the more that we give back to him the more we're able to receive from him so it's not just this one thing. Oh, it'd be enough. We'd never be able to give it all back to him for all the many times he's given to us. We'd be here the rest of our life. He's done so much for us. But just to know that the more I give of myself back to him and into his work, the more I'm available to be used of him again. For him to bless me all over again. I'm excited about that. Excited about uh, being part of this college, the kingdom of God. What he has in store, what the coolie was talking about, I was thinking about that. What a wonderful blessing that was to hear from all the, I guess it wasn't all of them, but to hear a testimony from some of the, the seniors and uh, hear what they had to say and to feel their heartbeat and what they think about living for God. Hey, it just keeps getting better and better. And I'm going to talk to you for the next few moments on something that deals uh, with folks and those people that are ready to go all the way in living for God. If this is just your second vocation, the thing that you do on the sideline, uh, this probably won't apply to you. But if you're committed to living for God, this is some things that's going to hit you right between the eyes. The book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, reading verse 15. Take it, we're just going out of one speaker now. So I need to really preach hard to these folks over here because they're not getting, getting as much. In addition to other reasons, I'm sure, but I'll keep that in mind. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 15. All of you that have the King James Version, let's read it together. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. For the next few moments, I'd like to speak with, to you about the weeds of bitterness. Let's ask the Lord to have his way in the remainder of this service. God, we need you. Lord, we're thankful for your many blessings, the many times you've given to us. We want to be able to give back to you with everything that's within us, God. So now we're asking that you'd open our hearts and our minds, anoint your servant as he brings forth your word, anoint our hearts and minds to receive from you. Lord, to be all that we can be for you, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, we ask it right now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. The modern proverb says, uh, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade and may I add when you get those lemons if you don't make lemonade those lemons that you've got are just going to keep on getting more bitter and more bitter and more bitter until pretty soon you look like a lemon and you become one what does it take to grow a weed for all of you FFAers farmers what does it take to grow a crop of weeds Really nothing at all. If you've got the soil, you got it there, those weeds are going to be there. And the better the soil, the better weeds you're going to grow. The more fertile the soil, the more weeds are going to be there. And if you don't plant anything, the weeds are still going to grow. And what I'm talking to you about this morning is something that's going to happen in your life. If you're living for God, seeds of bitterness are going to be there. No, it's not anything planned. It's not anything that you've placed there, but it's just part of life. It's going to happen. If the situation is something we can do about those seeds of bitterness. We can't stop the bird from flying overhead. It's just a natural thing of 
of living. And the same thing, as many times weeds get started from birds carrying seeds, wind blowing it, it's going to come into our life, into the plot that we have planted. And our situation is such that we need to do something about it to keep those roots, those weeds, the thing called bitterness from coming up and choking out the thing that we're trying to grow and try to accomplish for the work of God. Now you say, well, I don't really have much to offer. My field is empty, malnutrition soil. I'm here to tell you this morning that prophet Isaiah said he should grow before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. I don't care how barren and dry you are, how bad off you think you are, you plant Jesus there and he'll grow. Put Jesus in your life and something's going to happen. Nothing else may be able to flourish there. You may not be good for anything else. But plant Jesus there and he'll grow. He'll be the oasis in your desert. Turn that desert into an oasis. No matter how barren the ground is, no matter how dry it is, he'll grow there. But what we need to concentrate is being able to allow him to grow. And if we don't watch it, there's some other things that will grow up there at the same time that will come and choke out anything we're trying to do for God, anything good we're trying to do. Not because of anything we do or plan, but just it's there. We've got to allow the heavenly gardener to come in and till up the soil and break up the fallow ground and to work in our lives. It was Chuck Swindoll that said one time, life is 10% action and 90% reaction. And it is for living for God, much of the stuff and your effectiveness in living for God and what you're going to do for God now, next week, next year, 10 years down the road, is not so much on what you are going to do, but what you're going to do with what life has given you. And when people treat you wrong or something bad happens how you can take that and adjust to it use it for the glory of God now what exactly is a weed or what is bitterness what is root the scriptures tell us that uh, bitterness is characterized by hatred resentment now a weed is anything that you haven't planted for the farmer that's planting hay if some corn grows up in there it's a weed no matter how good that corn is Sometimes there are some situations in our life that uh, would divert us from the true task at hand. Maybe they're not bad in themselves, but for what God is trying to distill in our lives, it's taken away from that. We want to be what he wants us to be. Whatever crop he's planted in our life, when the Lord of the harvest comes, I want to be found ready to be harvested, have something to offer him. Is that the way you feel this morning? But bitterness in the scripture is something that's talked about, resentment, hatred, misery it's a symbol symbol of affliction misery servitude in jeremiah the fourth chapter it's talked of as wickedness the bitter wickedness of judah came from the heart simon magus in acts the eighth chapter had uh, the gall of bitterness it's a state of extreme wickedness if we really could define what bitterness is today i guess we could just call it uh, the inability to handle perceived wrong doings to our life or the the growth that comes out of the hothouse of misunderstanding and i'm convinced that uh, 90 percent of problems of conflicts that you have with one another that you have with mom and dad that you have with instructors that you have with with people 90 percent of them maybe more now, this isn't a scientific fact that i've researched out but i'm talking about in my life 90 percent of it comes from just misunderstanding or when the pastor comes by and has something else in his mind and doesn't talk to you, you think, something must be going wrong. He, he doesn't want to talk to me. And the next time something happens and he fails to shake your hand or to see you or to look your way, then you know something's wrong. You allow that to build up in your life. And I know this is an exaggerated example, maybe a, a stupid one, but the example is the same nonetheless. Before too long, you can have all sorts of bad feelings in your heart about what they must have thought and what he must have meant by not talking to me, by not... Uh, looking at me by him not wanting to be around me something must be wrong with me and well by the way i didn't like the way he preached sunday night anyway and now that you begin to think of it uh there's quite a few things we could talk about by him and before too long that just one little incident has caused a root to be dropped in your life and to grow up into one day is going to destroy you and to kill you now we're talking about some things that uh are not overnight a root it's something that uh, you don't even see. It's below the surface. And that's where it all starts. Just these little minor things, these little things. 
Everyone has the capabilities of growing stalks of bitterness. We're all ripe ground for that. And it is only through allowing God to continue to work in our lives that we will not. Now, what causes bitterness? What, what really uh, puts it on the line of what it's all about? Matthew 5, 45 talks about that a little bit. It rains on the just and the unjust. No special thing. It's just a thing of life, just like the weeds that grow up in a field. They're going to grow there. And if you don't uh, get them, they're going to keep on growing. And if you're trying to go grass there at the same time and you let the weeds grow, the weeds are going to be greener than the grass. They're going to take up all the nutrition out of the soil, and the grass is just going to have to suffer there if the grass is able to survive. In a garden, weeds grow up because of what is not done. In our life, wrongdoings are the, not the cause of bitterness and the fact that something's been done wrong to you, you've done something wrong, but it's the failure to deal with them in the correct manner. You see, we're all going to be done wrong or to think we've done wrong. Brother Holly preached a sermon one time, and I'll never forget about the man that uh, was willing to justify himself that Jesus talked about. Talked about in that sermon about in the prisons today, there's not a one person there that uh, thinks that they need to be there. They can all tell you why they, somebody else did it. And it's in the, it's in the makeup of mankind to justify yourself and to think that, that we're right. But at the same time, we're all human in the fact of conversing and uh, being around one another and living with one, around one another. We uh, say some things and do some things sometimes that are hindrance, hindrances and uh, or injuries to those we live around. That's just part of it. Now, that's, there's nothing we can do about that. The problem is, is in how you deal with it and where you're going to be 10 years from now because of that. Well, there's those times in our lives that uh, we come into church that we may knock the tops off some roots. And some things in your life that you know are wrong and you, the Spirit of God begins to move and work and get it all taken care of and cut off the tops of the roots. It looks a lot better feel a lot better but the same life giving force of that thing is still there all the time may have to start all over again but as long as it's still down there in the soil as long as there's still a root as long as it's still there it can come back and haunt us it'll be a hindrance to us take away the nutrition and the things in our life that need to be used for living for God and doing the work of God I learned uh, when I was younger I used to get money from pulling weeds now, this is out in Wyoming and out there, uh, that's all that grows, sagebrush and weeds. Uh, there's not any grass that just grows out in the field by itself. If you haven't planted anything, all that's going to be there is weeds. And you either have a yard of weeds or you have a, a bare yard unless you've planted, planted grass. You used to get paid for uh, pulling weeds. And uh, there was something to that. It was never folks I didn't know, but uh, like uh, parents and people in the church. And uh, it was worth a lot more if you could pluck the weeds out and they didn't come back next week and there was something to that you ch couldn't just go out there and, and pull on the weeds sure you could make it back level with the ground but in the ground there would still be there and next week boom there would be again but no it was a conscious effort and a lot of hard back breaking work to pull that root out of the ground now these are different kind of weeds than we have around here but the weeds would be as long as the thing straight down into the ground you'd have to pull it strong enough you'd all come out of the ground but uh it was something that had to be done if those weeds weren't going to grow back next week. And so, so many times in our lives, we take care of things on the surface. We can still feel God. We can still touch God. We think, well, we've knocked this thing in the head. It may still be that it's still there and growing. Yeah, you still have a walk with God. You still have a commitment with God. But as long as it's there in the soil, as long as it's resident in your life, one of these days it'll come back and haunt you. In the book of Hebrews, we find a lot of these... Uh, computer language, if-then statements, uh, while-do statements, that uh, if we hold fast to the end, we're going to be one of the chosen few at the end. While we remain in the trust of God and totally relying upon Him, we're going to make it to the end. And this verse, the 15th verse, is the 12th chapter, is kind of like that at the same time. So really, you need to take careful regard and examine your life so that in spite of all God's done for you, you don't miss out in the end. What this verse is really saying there is just simply this. Watch out. Because if you don't watch out, in spite of all God has done for you and the grace that he shed for you, the 
grace that he's provided and we have in our lives and can take advantage of. In spite of all that, if we don't watch out, a little root of bitterness will be in our life, and when it springs up, it'll destroy us, and it'll be all to no avail. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not just in this for this week or next week. This is my life. These are the proving grounds and the training grounds so that when we get out of here, we'll be that much more effective. Amen? Amen. This is not the, the culmination. It's going to be a mighty moment and a wonderful time when those that are seniors graduate here and just, uh, you know, they could tell me the number of days. Thank you. But, uh, the hours, maybe even some of them, will be a wonderful moment. But that's just the beginning of uh, full-time working for God and out into the field and out in the harvest, no matter what their title may be, no matter what it is they may be doing. This is just the beginning and where God is beginning to do some things in our life. And this is one of the things that we've got to watch out for. That five years down the road, ten years from now, that doesn't all start caving in on us. It will be no good if we backslide a week before the rapture. And what have we accomplished if when the Lord of the harvest comes, there isn't no crop there to be harvested. But oh, I want to be able to stand before him and say, here it is, Lord, everything I've done for you. And be able to hear from him. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. So today we want to examine our lives and make sure that there's nothing like that growing up in our lives. That maybe is below the surface. And these are some things that we've got to allow God to check out for us. It's not anything that you're going to maybe even notice or even think is wrong. But when we allow his spirit to move in our lives, he'll make us aware of those things. We know what bitterness is. Now, how to avoid bitterness. There's two things, verses of Scripture in the uh, New Testament that deal with that. And of those two, they both go back to uh, the person who was wronged, who must take the first action. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 24th, 25th, and 24th verse, talks about if uh, you're going to go pray, you get down to the altar and you notice your brother has aught against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go to him. And then when you've been reconciled to your brother, go back and offer your gift to the altar. I remember a time just a couple years ago when that verse of Scripture really hit home with me. It was on Accent Weekend. Brother Rex Johnson was preaching. I was sitting back there about the middle on the uh, left-hand side. And uh, there was a guy sitting here on the front seat that uh, kind of obstructed my view of Brother Johnson as he uh, made passes around the building and as he moved. It just seemed that every time I'd look up towards the front, there he would be. And uh, there was something about that just uh, in the months previous to that. And really, I, we, was, we were juniors then. Uh, there had been times that uh, he would say things, uh, just kind of picking and teasing uh, about this or that. Or uh, what do you dress like that for? Why didn't you comb your hair this morning? Why didn't you do this? Just kind of picking and teasing. I've always uh, had a problem with that for those of you that have not uh, tried to adjust my tie any time this year. And if it's straight right now, it's probably a miracle. Uh, that is the thing that's kind of been a joke, uh, and it has been adjusted many times, and 10 minutes later, it's uh, back the same way it was with Aaron around now, and if I'm around Aaron, it only stays straight for about five seconds, because he loves to swing from it, but uh, that's neither here nor there. The bottom line was, with this young man, she had said some things, and kind of joking, this wasn't anything to do with the ties or, or that, uh, just kind of joking, but uh, it had kind of gotten to me. Because, see, this was the kind of guy, he really was a slob himself. Now, this is my side of the story. You don't know the guy, you're not going to know his name. I better make sure it doesn't slip. Uh, uh, he wasn't really a slob. But uh, anyway, he had problems dressing too, okay? And he, I mean, he was always mixed matched, you know, polyester suits and had all the stuff. And it was, a, you know, he had no room to talk. Okay, this is me talking now. But, you know, we kind of kidded back and forth. Well... That accent weekend, here he's sitting on the front row, just standing on the front row, just to worship in God, just getting everything he could out of it. And I'm back there, and I see him, and after what he said to me and what he's done, how can he, how can he worship God? I mean, he shouldn't be doing that. I mean, what it was doing, it was working on me, and I ended up not worshiping God. About halfway through the service, I realized what was happening, and I made a point that night after service to go to him. And... The scripture says if you know that your brother has ought against you, go to him. But sometimes when we think that they've done us wrong, we begin to examine our lives. We, we see that uh, maybe we've done some things wrong. And so then uh, by the time it all got worked out, I had, uh, 
had to kind of apologize to him and told him what the situation was and I didn't want to miss out on the rest of Accent Weekend and to him uh, it was nothing to him it was hurting me and it would have continued to hurt me I wouldn't have gotten anything out of all three of the services not in just one uh, but after we talked about it got it all worked out it's kind of a joke now but and it, it was a stupid thing I mean you know who cares if plaids and dots don't go together you know uh, I mean, in reality, if you're dressing for success, that might make a little difference. But uh, so what if it didn't work? It was something done, but it would have gotten a hold of me. It would have worked on my life. It had already affected me in the fact that I didn't get to worship that servant. But uh, by going to him, we got it alleviated. To him, it was not bothering me to know there was anything wrong there. So we took care of There's two Two wrong things you can do when uh, you feel that someone's done something against you or bothered you with something they said. Number one, keep it to yourself. And all it's going to do most of the time we will know something's wrong. It just slipped out of their mouth that they didn't even say anything to them was wrong. It's going to work on you and destroy you, continually affect your attitude towards them and what you think about them, your perception of them, your esteem for them, how you look at them. And that's going to be also magnified if you do more than just keep it to yourself but you tell someone else about it and not them because then not only are you affecting yourself but you're getting someone else in on it and then the bottom line as we're going to see here in just a minute you may uh, send someone to hell beside yourself the fact of when it all gets working on you now this is something that's trivial and I'm kind of just running through the bare facts of what this is but I'm telling you before God this morning uh, this is the stuff that kills folks I mean, we're talking about stuff ser more serious than cancer. Now, this is not something we've got uh, reason enough for celebration. We're all fixing to leave and gone for spring break. We can handle something of this nature today. Uh, at the same time, I want to make it all the way for living for God. And this is a thing that can grow up into our lives, take root in life. Another verse of Scripture that talks about this is Romans, the, 12th, the 10th chapter, the 12th verse. Uh, probably all heard it. One of those Scriptures that we talk about, got to know that the real meaning to understand it. Uh, talks about heaping coals of fire on your, your enemy's head. If he hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him something to drink. And in so doing, you're going to heap coals of fire on his head. Now, uh, I think you'll notice in the scripture it says love your neighbors. It also says love your enemies. You ever think they might be the same people? That's when it uh, kind of hits home. Uh, but anyway... There's three interpretations of this right here, the one that we all love, to thinking that if our enemy comes, up, comes around us, the way we can get back at him is by feeding him or, or uh, giving him something to drink, and then God is going to pour fire on top of his head and burn him up. We're going to take care of it. And boy, we just love that. That's great. Um, just a symbol of damnation. The Psalm 140th, 140th chapter talks about that a little bit, the 10th verse. But I'm not real... custom is uh, this that uh, by assisting your enemy makes his face all hot and red and he becomes all can't understand why you're doing it and makes him think about what his actions may have been and may lead to reconciliation and may lead to, to repentance now uh, whatever it is the bottom line I've said that twice now what uh, the uh, end result of this is the fact that uh, you the person that's been wronged is the person that's responsible for all this. doesn't say anything about your enemy doing anything to you. But when your enemy has done something wrong to you, when you've been wrong, what you have to do about it. Now, that is all fine and good and we can handle this. This is great and dandy when it's these little insignificant things like someone saying something about the way you dress. You know, these trivial things and looking back, you can laugh about them. This was nothing to that. But what about those situations when you've really been hurt? What about those situations when you've really, truly been wronged? When someone has hurt you? And I suppose, just like the halls of hell are filled today, 
we could all raise our hands and say, I know I've been wrong. The difference between us and them is that uh, we have not allowed us to get it down, but everyone that's ever backslid has an excuse. You know, someone's done something wrong or someone in the church isn't acting right. You know, things aren't right. It's their fault, their problem. But to get back to the person who it really affects, ourself, and the person who is ultimately responsible, it's ourselves. Yes, I'm sorry that maybe you have been wrong. Maybe you have been hurt. And I'm sorry I don't have any better news, but if you work for God and in the kingdom of God, there's going to be some more times where you're going to be slapped in the face. Maybe not literally, but there's going to be some things that hurt. And we could handle it if it was our enemy. And if it was the world, we could say, I can count it all joy. Rejoice in the Lord because I've been worthy to suffer for his name. When it's those people out there on the job and they make fun of us and you say, yes, I'm being persecuted for the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm doing it. But when it's your brother, when it's your parents, when it's someone close to you, Oh, it's another thing. Now, I'm not talking about uh, how we react to correction. Remember that sermon that Brother Gray taught on bastards and sons? That's a whole other area about being able to receive correction. We're talking about when you have been wrong, when you've been taken advantage of unduly, when someone has really hurt you, and it's wrong, it's out in the open, you can tell it. What do you do then? That is what is going to determine whether or not you can live for God. That is where God is putting you on the block to see what you'll do. How important your will and how important your feelings are anyway. See, we do all have feelings and we all have been wronged and taken advantage of. And you've been hurt and it's probably going to happen again. But we don't have to let that get us down. But let that just be something that points us closer to the cross. Draws us near to him. There was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Ahithophel. Some of you may know him. Uh, I know none of you know him personally, but uh, he was David's counselor. And tradition and through the scripture, we find out that uh, he was a great man. And we're told that really, if there wouldn't have been Jonathan, it may have been said that Ahithophel and David were as one and their hearts were knit. In other words, what I'm saying here, Ahithophel was the next best friend to David other than Jonathan. Somewhere along there, they were boy, boyhood comrades. And it, it came to be as they came to the kingdom. And as David became king, well, here's his good buddy Ahithophel, whose counseling was as the oracles of God, the scripture tells us, right there beside him. His buddy, I mean, hey, it just worked out great. You know, they're pals been t- in times past. And so Ahithophel is David's counselor. He is also a lady by the name of Bathsheba's grandfather. We all know the story. Sad it is, David fell into sin. But you ever wondered why uh, this house was so close, close to David that he could see it? Could see uh, the housetop of uh, Uriah and Bathsheba from uh, his house? Because they were close. This was uh, some of his buddies. And I'm not saying that uh, Bathsheba and uh, David and uh, Uriah were all good friends. But they, had, they were family of a good friend of David's. So well, they were right there around close. David sinned, wrong, hit the fell. Can you imagine what it must have been like? A slap in the face to hit the fell. I hear his good friend going and killing the husband of his granddaughter and what he did with her. You can imagine he'd been wronged. We don't have any question with that, right? I mean, this was, we all know the sin that David did. It was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. But there was also some other folks in, involved in that. And there's three different uh, things that could have happened in this scenario. David could have call, come to, to Ahithophel and said, look, I'm sorry. I know how this affected you. And I'm sorry about it. I've, I've asked God to forgive me. I'm asking you to forgive me now. But he didn't. In fact, what really happened, and this is what really is, gets you when this happens in your life. The only time that David came clean is when the prophet of God came to him and said, hey, buddy, the jig's up. You've been found out. And then still, he didn't say anything to Ahithophel. So as the story goes, we find Ahithophel just a short months, years later. Absalom, David's son, 
tried to take the kingdom away from David. And where do we find Ahithophel? But still nursing that bitterness and that wrongdoing that David had did to him. True. I don't mean to change anyone's attitude about uh, this guy by the name of Ahithophel or King David. But when we look at it objectively, maybe David was at fault and David needed to have gone to him. But the bottom line is he didn't. Maybe David didn't even know what, realize what had happened as far as how that affected Ahithophel. What we do know is that Ahithophel was destroyed because of it. He went out and killed himself. Ahithophel went on Absalom's side. Any of you know the story of what happened with that? that uh, he also called another counselor. Absalom did to come and help. And Ahithophel was trying to get back at David and told told Absalom how he could conquer David. And if Absalom would have listened to Ahithophel, David would have uh, perished in that. David's forces would have been uh, non-existent, would have been wiped off, because Ahithophel knew all about David, had been around him all his life, knew where his strengths were, knew where his weaknesses weren't. Instead, there was another counselor that came along, and Absalom said, you know, I, I, like, uh, I like his counsel a little better. I am think I'm going to take his advice instead of the advice of Ahithophel. After that happened, we find where Ahithophel said, that's it, it's all over with, it's no good. Life's not worth living. I'm not going to be able to get back at David for what he's done to me. I'm going to go ahead and end my life. Now you think, my, all because of something like that? But I'm telling you, it had grown in his life. It had started with just a root of bitterness. It had started maybe correctly. He had been done wrong. He had been given an injustice. But it started from that, and here we find Ahithophel where he allowed it to grow until finally his whole life was consumed with that, and the only thing that was important to him was getting back at David. Oh, if I can make David suffer. If I can make David look bad. And so when that didn't work out, what is life and what is life worth living? He goes off and hangs himself. Now you say, that never happened to me. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? It starts with just those little things. And maybe this isn't so little. If it had been you, this wouldn't have been a little situation. There had been a wrong done. This man was wronged. Well, he may have been justified in the way he felt, but the bottom line was he kept it in himself. He didn't go to David and say, look, David, I feel bad about what you've, what you've done to me or maybe the way I feel about it. I want to get it right. I'm coming to you because I don't want this to be in my life. No, he didn't. He kept it within himself, and yet we find just a few short years later what happened. He killed himself because of it. First Samuel, we have a, another situation where a person had the opportunity to become bitter. Her name was Hannah. First Samuel, the first chapter. Scripture says that she was bitter, bitterness of soul. She came to the house of God, though. See, she tried to talk to her husband. Uh, we'll call him Elkanah for my pronunciation help. You may pronounce it different. But anyway, she went to her husband, Elkanah, and said, Look, I want a son so bad. He didn't understand. He said, Look, am I not better than ten sons? He just thought she needed a little more attention. Thought she was feeling sorry for herself. Penaniah, the other wife, she loved it. She thought, This is my chance to help Hannah become humble because I have sons and daughters and she doesn't have any. So the scripture says that she vexed her sore. She teased her about it told about look I've got uh, sons and daughters and you don't have any she didn't understand the prophet of God the priest Eli she went to the priest was in the house of God he didn't understand what it was all about oh the important thing about it was no one understood what was going on in her life no one understood the bitterness of soul she felt no one understood how, how she felt about it all but she went to the altar she went to the house of God no one else may understand what you're going through. No one else may understand what's happened into your life. They can't understand. They don't know what it's all about, but you don't have to worry about that if you can only get to the altar. If you can only get to him. If you can only tell him about it. He's the only one that can do anything about it. And so we find her situation taken care of. You know the wonderful story of great prophet Samuel came out of that situation. In the book of Ruth, we find a lady who had had to go out into Moab, into a type of the world, because of the famine. And there when she got out there, everything went wrong. 
first she lost her husband, then she lost her sons, she's lost her whole identity, she's realized she's nothing, and she finally decides not to end her life, and in the midst of her bitterness, she said, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara, because the Lord hath made me bitter the way he's dealt with me. In the midst of her bitterness, no, she didn't give it up all, on all of it, she didn't go hang herself, but she went back. She went back to her homeland. She went back to the house of God. She went back to the land of God. And there we find the wonderful story of what happened to Naomi and the person that went back with her that we know is a descendant of Jesus Christ in Ruth, the wonderful love story of Ruth and Boaz. It's sad in a way because old Naomi, she didn't want those girls to go with her. She told Orpha and Ruth, y'all go back to your folks. I, I'm not going to have any more sons along that you can marry. Might as well go, go around someone else. I'm not going to be able to help you out. And yet because of Ruth's persistence, because of the dire she had, she went ahead on back. There's going to be some folks in spite of your bad attitude. And, behind, and beside your problems, they're going to have a desperate desire that they want to get hold of God. don't matter what you think. But what about the orphans? What would have happened to her if Naomi would have said, yeah, go ahead and come on with me. Come back to where, to our land. Come with my house. I believe there's some folks out there in the world today that are not going to be reached if we allow bitterness to, to get a hold of our lives. But if all we can just say, I, I know where we can go. I know where we can go back home. I know where the Lord can take care of the problem. I know where he can work on it. Hey, they're looking for the answer. They're looking for something like this. And they're looking for some folks that know their God and haven't been uh, disillusioned by the things that happened in their life. I was told just the other day of about a young man that came here in the early 80s full of the Holy Ghost, ready to do something for God, and uh, went down to some store somewhere, some mall, and lo and behold, there were some folks in the bar in there. And it just totally wiped him out. Some folks, some seniors, or some folks from here that he looked up to, and it just totally knocked him out. If that's what it's all about, I don't want anything about it, to do with it. I'm happy to say today that he's living for God, that he's, he's doing the work of God, but it's a shame when we don't, aren't able to take advantage of the things that people look up to. Seniors, there's folks looking up to you. You may not realize it, but watching you and how you act, how you take situations and problems is going to affect what they do in life and how they're going to view the situation. Yes, we all have situations and problems in our lives that we could have gotten bitter about and said, it's no use. And those of you that have been raised in the church all your life, you know more about that. You, you know all about it. You know what it's all about, for, to be wrong, for someone to say something that maybe just got all bent out of shape, didn't get back to the source of it. Maybe something major. You know what it's like to hurt from someone on the inside. But they're not going to be affected by it. It's what you do about it that's going to happen. Oh, that we can be like Job. And when the Lord has to take some things away, has to do some things that maybe we don't see them as right, we can say the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I used to know you as the ear heareth, but now I've seen you with my own eyes, as he said. To be like Paul and Silas, and when we've been abused and put in prison and whipped, that at midnight we still have enough of God in our lives that haven't warped our attitude that we can sing praises to him. In the middle of the problem, that we can be like Hannah and cry out to God. That we can be like Naomi and go back to God. But there are those in Scripture and there are those all down through history that never did make it. Ahithophel, yes, got to give it to you, man. You were wrong. Someone did you wrong. I'm sorry about that, but you're in hell all because of what you didn't do because of it. It was up to you to change your attitude about it, to go and confront the problem. I don't know what you think about any person that's ever done anything wrong against you, but I would hate to think that they were closer to God than I was. But in reality, no matter how rank of a sinner, who they are, what the situation is, if you've allowed them and what they've done to you be, to become between you and God, they're closer to you than God is. I mean, they're closer to God than you are. But I don't want anything between me and God. There's three people in the Scriptures that went and killed themselves talks about in bitterness. Ahithophel was one because he was wrong. Another one by the name of Saul. 
got a little jealous, allowed the thing to consume him. The scripture says he was consumed with bitterness. He finally told that old guy after he'd been wounded, go ahead and kill me. Go ahead and end it. It's all over with. David, David's gotten a thing. I don't know about you, but this is the kind of thing that irks me. Now, Saul had been, had slain his thousands. David had slain his ten thousands. All of a sudden, Saul's not getting all the glory and all the credit that he thinks he needs to get. But that don't really matter, folks. I've had people tell me before, they're using you. You're being used. Well, I beg your pardon, but what in the world are we in this for? Is this my church? Or to me to have a list behind my name of what I've done or what I can do? This is God's kingdom. To him belongs the glory. To him be all the praise. I'm working for him. What he thinks is what matters. I hope I'm being used. I hope that all my life I can say I've been used. And I'm sorry to say, a lot of times he doesn't speak in an audible voice and tell me what I need to do. He speaks through those that are over me and my superiors and tells me how I'm to do the will of God in my life. Amen? Amen. See where I'm coming from? I don't ever want to get to the place where I've got to have this much money, I've got to have this title to be able to do something for God. But God, whatever it is, whatever you need done, I want to be there. I want to be able to stand in the gap. Here am I, Lord. Send me. I'm not worried about where it is or what it is, but I want to be willing to sow the word. I want to be willing to sow it wherever it may be. Yet we find Saul that got all bent out of shape because of that, because he couldn't be number one. I'm sorry, folks. You're going to have to play second fiddle sometimes. Sometimes you may have to play 49th fiddle. But, oh, if we can just make a more pleasing sound in the eyes and the ears of God, more pleasing to him. Something that will attract the world to realize we've got something on the inside that will change their life, that will give them something worth living for. Hey, if I need to learn to play the flute, if I need to learn to play the fiddle, whatever it is, if I can make the whole orchestrated effect that much better, put it in my hand. I want to learn it. Whatever it is. I may not be the best at it, but Brother Crispo, I want to be found doing it. Whatever I can add. But see, that goes back to our own will and what we want to do. But I'm sorry to tell you, in light of all you know and all you can do, and your many abilities and talents, uh, God is not Zig Ziglar, Earl Nightingale, Og Mandino. He doesn't care about what you think about yourself. And I'm sorry if you don't have a very good esteem of yourself. But the idea is not just to pump yourself up and to think of anything that you can think of you can do. The idea is to lose yourself in Jesus Christ. Then you'll find something worth living for. Then you'll find something worth doing. Then you'll find meaning in your life. Only when we lose ourselves in him. Old Judas. Find him going and using the rope too. Why? Things didn't work out the way he wanted it. I wonder how many of us here have been guilty of having our, our concept of what we want to do for God. Now, God, this is what I want to do for you. I want to be this for you, God, and this is what I want to do for you. Judas had that in mind. He knew what he wanted God to do and what he wanted to be in that kingdom. He, he thought the kingdom was going to be of power and of might. And Jesus kept talking about this mercy and uh, love and uh, not using swords and shields. And that, it didn't work that way. It wasn't going to work that way. So, and it may have even been that when Judas portrayed Jesus in the garden, it may have been he was trying to force his hand to get him to finally have to confront it on to finally act and to finally use force. And when he didn't, even then, he had done everything he could, and Judas had tried every way he could to get God to fit into his little plan in the way he thought he needed to work. And because he wouldn't, because he couldn't, because he didn't, he went out and hung himself. It was all over with. He was bitter about it all, and it was something that had consumed him. Something because simply he had not submitted to Almighty God and allowed him to be first place in his life. Yes, there are going to be some, some hardships in life, and I'm looking forward to that heaven's jubilee and when I get to see him, but I'm thankful to know today that there's joy in the journey all along the way. And there's some good things that are going to happen all along the way. I don't want to be found just thinking about heaven all the time. But if I live today, I've got a work I can do today. If he comes tonight, I want to be ready. If he comes right now, I want to be ready. But in the meantime, if he doesn't, there's someone else I can reach, someone else I can talk to, something else I can do for his kingdom. 
Let us never get lulled in the fact of thinking we've got it all lined up. God has his own timetable. We don't want to become bitter and allow things to choke us out. I'm not talking to you about something that is not known to me. And I'm not being a martyr by saying this because many of you could say the same thing. I've been hurt before. I've been bitter before. I've had things where it's made me turn around and decide this wasn't worth it. I heard a singing group the other night sing a song, and the guy got up and testified about it and said, you know, I've been in the church all my life, got the Holy Ghost, I was about nine years old, and I, hey, yeah, he's, I can identify that. I know where we're coming from. He said, you know, in spite of it all and, and living life all, all my life, I've never had any questions about it all, and I've always known that I was going to make it all the way and that I was going to make it to heaven and that one day that would be my reward. But, well, I can't really worship on that song. Because I'm sorry, there's been some times I've had some questions. There's been some times where situations and circumstances have clouded my view, and I've wondered, what in the world is this all about? But I'm thankful that in spite of that, the Lord's still there. If we'll go to Him, if we'll turn it over to Him, He'll take care of it. No matter what the situation may be, no matter how wrong you have been, it's not going to get any better to tell anyone else about it, except to go to that person and go to the throne. There's two things involved in there. And oh, if you don't, I'm sure you may work fine. You still may have a crop growing. But one of these days, those weeds of bitterness are going to consume you. I'm not talking to you out of an empty head here this morning. I'm talking to you out of the facts of life. I'm talking to you about my hero. I'm talking to you about a person that uh, at one time was very important in my life. See, I was not raised in the world. I never had basketball heroes. My hero was a man of God. Daddy was great. He was super. But at the age of seven, eight, nine, and ten, there was another man that was, he was it. He was what I wanted to be like. Brother Griffin would tell you that he's one of the, was one of the men that uh, could explain the oneness and the truth of water baptism in Jesus' name and was one of the best teachers he'd ever heard. And yet today, He's not anywhere near all this. Something happened. I remember at 10 and 11 being around him and going to camps and, and hearing the way he'd talk about certain folks and the way things would get, were getting at him. Now, we're not talking about some young uh, flame in the Lord, some guy that just got a dose of the Holy Ghost last week and still on the effects of it. We're talking about a minister that uh, uh, 20, 25 years ago had a church of 400, district superintendent, uh, been in the Serm church, been in the same place 30 years. We're talking about someone that had been through the fire, been through the flood, knew what it was all about. And yet one little thing began to grow in his life. It was nothing major. Maybe he had been wrong. Maybe there was something done wrong there. I'll, I'll give him that. But at the same time, he allowed it to grow up and to destroy his life. Today, my grandfather... Is nowhere near living for God. There's been a lot of things that have come out and things he's done wrong in his life. And yet to talk to him, you'd still hear the same teaching man, same knowledge of the scriptures. Yet he feels as if nothing's been wrong. It's totally consumed him. There's another plant there. Something else has grown up there. And he's at the place where he thinks it's the real thing. It's the same thing. And the more I think about it, I can think back to those times when would he would comment on what so-and-so said or what that pastor said or what they thought or what he thought about them. Mark it down. If you've got any enmity in your heart about anybody now, it's going to grow. It's going to keep on getting worse unless you can take that to the cross and get that taken care of. It's not going to get any better. It's like getting married. There's a little problem there. I'm sorry, honey. It's not going to work itself out when you get married. It's just going to keep on growing. But, oh, I'm so thankful we can take it to the cross of Calvary. I'm so we can, we can confront the person. We can get it taken care of. Yes, you may be at wrong. You may have been wrong. But I don't want to be a dry old, shriveled up, bitter person, not fit for use in the kingdom of God. Can we stand? The opportunity for weeds of bitterness to grow in your life are there. They'll always be there. 
But you don't have to allow it to destroy you. You can allow that to make you better instead of bitter. There's an animal here on the southern end of this continent called the brown pelican. Who Every time he goes to eat, he scoops up and eats fish, and he can handle two and a half gallons of water in his mouth at the same time. And before he can swallow that fish, he's got to drain all the water out. Well, it just so happens that uh, in the process of doing that, any smart, crafty little seagull can come by and take that fish out of his mouth that he's draining out and get it all, the water drained out. And if there's any seagulls around that are hungry, it's going to be a while before he gets something to eat. And you say, well, that's wrong. That's, how does, that, that, should, that shouldn't be. There's a lot of things in your life that maybe shouldn't have been and shouldn't be. And people shouldn't have done. But it happens nonetheless. And that old seagull could just, I mean, that old pelican just decide, okay, I'm not going to eat. Forget you, old seagulls. You go get your, your, your food yourself. I'm not going to feed you. I suppose he'd be justified in doing that, if pelicans could think. Uh, and if they do, maybe one of them have tried it before, but he's no with it, longer with us. He's dead. You get what I'm saying? He's got to keep on doing that. And as long as there's crafty seagulls around, he's going to have to keep on feeding them long as they're hungry but see it's preparing him for something else on down the road you see when just a couple months down the road when uh, the younger come out and the babies are around there he has to know how to fish and from all this practicing and doing all this extra fishing for all those seagulls he's gotten pretty good at it so now he pretty well knows how to fish I mean he knows how to just scoop that bill and he's got a fish in there He's learned how to do that. Not only that, when those babies have gotten there, he's got to feed them, and they eat out of his mouth for three or four months. He's got to be continually giving them something to eat. And so really, the situation that life has given him has just prepared him for something beautiful and new that was coming in store in the future. If you look at those situations, those things that could destroy you is that, folks. I promise you, there will be some beautiful things that happen in the future. Some things that you wouldn't have been able to take advantage of. Maybe some things that wouldn't have come into being because you were warped, because you didn't go through this situation. All because you've allowed him to break up that fallow ground and be able to take care of any of those weeds of bitterness that would work in your lives. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to have anything against you. And there's some of you here that know I've come to you and said, look, and it may be that I've got something against you or you've got, I feel you've got something against me. You may not have anything against me, but if I feel that, I'm going to come to you because it's hurting me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.